Hello! Welcome to Free Will, Science, and Religion. I'm Chandler Klebs, and I'm here with Felicia Hogan, Jamie Soden, David Joseph, Trick Slattery, George Ortega, and Michael Walsh. It's quite a crowd. And Felicia Hogan has a topic for us um, that's Valentine's Day related and about relationships and attachment. So I'm going to turn it over to Felicia Hogan, and she can present this attachment theory that she's emailed us about. Thank you, Chandler. Um, like I said, I want to go over attachment theory. And I thought that was especially fitting for Valentine's Day, considering it's all about love and bonding, friendships, relationships. So we're going to take a look at how our relationships when we're younger molds and how it affects who we are as we get older and what that has to do with free will. So... Attachment theory, according to uh, psychologistworld.com and verified by a friend of mine who's going through school to be a forensic linguist, it says, Attachment theory is a concept in developmental psychology that concerns the importance of attachment in regards to personal developments. Specifically, it makes the claim that the ability for an individual to form an emotional and physical attachment to another person gives a sense of stability and security necessary to take risks, branch out, and grow and develop a personality. Essentially, how relationships, especially as children, affect your personality, actions, and decisions. So then I wanted to open it up to uh, the rest of the co-hosts to discuss what implications you think that might have on free will. Um, George, do you have anything to say? Well, that that uh, sounds great. Felicia, should we go right into that? Um, you want us to absolutely go let's go ahead let's go ahead and talk about what implications that might have and then Excellent. we'll get some more in, in depth with that all right so my feeling is that i think these attachments essentially form i would imagine during the first five years of life they're very connected with um the mother and the parents but i'm also guessing that whatever kind of deficits might have developed in, in the ability to form and maintain attachments can be probably pretty much reversed um, during the next, let's say, 10 years, the, the years a person's in grade school. So how this relates to the free will thing is like, to the, to the extent we understand that the people we become, you know, in, in all areas, in, in areas like attachment especially, that, that's so important to our relationships and all, that these are not up to us. You know, who we become is not up to us and so, like, the idea is, like, if we're, for whatever reason, unfortunate in, in developing healthy, effective attachment styles when we're very young, then, then this free will issue becomes very important because it tells us that, like, when we get into grade school, you know, if, if, our, if our academic, you know, systems, you know, begin to just not focus on math and, and in science and history, but just, you know, on very important life skills like relationships and happiness, then I think we can just like make great strides to ensuring that by the time we all become adults, we have these very, you know, effective relationship um, abilities and qualities. I think you made some, ex some excellent points there. Does anybody else have any ideas that they wanted to say on, um, how if or assuming that the relationships we have when we're younger forms and molds who we become, our personality, actions, decisions, everything, what does that say for free will? Well, I get the basic idea because like we say on this podcast all the time, obviously what happens now is based on the past and we can't choose the past of what happens and I think that if just a general observation, if you know your friends, the people you know the best, if you knew how they grew up and then you match that up with the personality they have when they're an adult, you might see a connection there. You might might see what's right or wrong with them in this, as far as their ability to form relationships. I love that you brought that up, Chandler, considering that's actually what brought us to this topic to begin with. Uh, a friend of mine who we're going to call Layla, it's a pseudonym, uh, I promise her anonymity, so we're going to call her Layla. Layla, going to school for forensic linguistics, was in a, is in her child development class, and they were discussing attachment theory and how the different attachment styles with the parents, what those kids look like when they grow up. And she took a look at 
the descriptions of what an adult who was raised the way she was raised typically ends up like. And she was, she was kind of torn apart because she realized that was her. All of the things that are wrong with her life right now that she struggles with can be traced back to how her parents interacted with her actually in the first two years of life. And so and that, 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 was, that was really that, hard for her. And that, 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 that is a profound implication because like, in other words, like with the free will belief, you know, people believe, well, you know, a person's the way they are because of their free will, that's the, what they're choosing. And to the extent that we understand, no, we don't choose how we were raised during the first two years. We don't choose, you know, whether we develop um, or not these effective styles. And especially the other part is like that um, understanding that we don't have a free will means that to whatever extent we didn't learn what we should have in the past, we can nonetheless begin to wor learn it even as adults. Absolutely. Um, another observation based uh, going off of what Chandler mentioned is that when I was uh, coaching gymnastics for five or six years, I noticed that typically the kids who were the most difficult want to rip my hair out and quit my job kind of kids were the ones who had a really just terrible home life. And to see that effect on their actions, their behaviors, the way they interacted with the, with the world. Understanding someone's home life and how they grew up, so it makes you understand so much more about why they are the way they are now. What, were they rude uh, to other people and stuff? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I had uh, one, one girl who, for instance, one girl, she was five or six, yeah. and she would scream mm. if she didn't get a pink hula hoop. Mm. You're way too old for this kind of tantrum. And she would just scream non-stop because she didn't understand how to communicate her her desires and her needs mm. because of the kind of home life that she had. You know, kids who are pushing, who are shoving, calling other kids names, a lot of times the bullies. Yeah. And so, what, so like, the free will belief, that makes... Um, life for that little girl because sure she she makes life difficult for people around her but you've got to imagine what what she's going through you know and then to add to it that people blame her for being that way exactly know? and some of these uh, kids have mental disorders that make them like scream like Tour like Tourette syndrome that's a, a speech impairment isn't it people would talk like constantly say things that they don't mean because they have Tourette's and then it's, you know, people... it's more like a, a mental tick yeah uh, but I, I also had kids who were on the autistic spectrum who, mm. would, like, there's one little boy who insisted on taking off his pants like every other class. Ooh, um, he'd on like the mat at some point. <laughs> like, it, oh. it was very difficult. It was difficult to keep him following directions and focused, keep him from climbing the pole up to the ceiling. Just, you know, it's very difficult, but we also recognize it's not his fault. And this one particular, the little girl I was telling you about, she was the bane of my existence. For, for um, a period of several weeks before I, I, someone, one of the other coaches talked to me about, you know, what her home life was like. And when I realized why she was the way she was, you know, punishing her doesn't help. Mm. However, yes. what I did was work That's with her. Yeah. Go ahead, Jamie. Yeah, and it certainly won't encourage them to change their attitude either. I mean... I don't, I, I don't agree with like um, smacking children because that's what some parents seem to, you know, well, did in the old times. They used to smack their kids if they were misbehaving and stuff. And that doesn't help at all. Oh, uh, we did, we did basically timeouts. Um, what I did instead was work with her and say, you know, when you're, I'm, I'm not going to talk with you while you're screaming or while you're whining, but if you want to tell me. In a, in a normal tone of voice, what you would like. I can do everything I can to make that happen for you. But I need you to communicate with me in a constructive manner. And by the end of the semester, she was like a completely different student. Mm. By Just by understanding where she was coming from. And uh, now that I've read about attachment theory, I understand that it was because she didn't understand how to communicate her needs in, in order to get them met because they weren't being met at home. 
So what part of this do you uh, think is... I have one is... question about... Oh, go ahead, Mike. I just wanted to, to ask you, Felicia, um, what is it about the kind of upbringing that these kids has that leads them to this kind of, you know, behavior? Is it neglect? Is it abuse? Is it molestation? Like, what is it? Um, we will come back to that, if that's okay. <laughs> hey, okay. hey, Felicia, do you think that... Do you think <laughs> that... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Do you think that uh, there's any genetic factors involved here? Like, like for example, as a child, you know, you have all these specific characteristics, and you're equating, I think, these characteristics to maybe maybe future characteristics of an adult. Do you think that has any genetic factor rather than just purely environmental here? I'm sure there is some. Um, attachment theory works mostly with nurture versus nature, but. A, a smaller portion of that, a significantly small portion of that, is the child's own temperament. You know, some children have different needs than others. Some children naturally want more attention than others. Some children are naturally more independent and more curious, and some children are not. So there's some degree of which the child's temperament and the just the way they are already factors into this. It's not entirely nurture. That was a good question. Yeah, I've um I've heard of a study where they actually removed a um a gene from I, f I think it was rats and it was a learning gene, and so these rats were were pretty pretty much dumb and the consensus was then that uh, you know learning is a, a genetic thing, but then they took the rats without that learning gene and put them in a different environment, and those rats were pretty much as smart as the, the rats with the learning gene. So well, I think that, but yeah, it, it, it kind of goes with the, the whole attachment thing. So yeah, you know, how if, if, your if, environment if, shapes Exactly, you. exactly, yeah. Uh, so then I wanted to go into a little bit more in depth about what the attachment theory is and its history. Um, the phrase attachment theory was coined by a, a psychologist in the 50s or 60s by the name of John Boldby. And he established that a child's development depends heavily on a child's ability to form a strong relationship with, quote, at least one primary caregiver. And that's mostly from uh, psychologistworld.com. And if we expand on that a bit more, he found that children with strong or secure attachments have many Im immediate needs met so they can focus on exploring and learning. So if a child is hungry and their parent then feeds them, they have more time, more energy, and are more likely to interact with the world around them, which is the basis of childhood development, versus kids whose parents neglect them or maybe aren't there at the time to feed them or are too busy or anything like that. Um, those kids tend to be more angry, resentful. They're in, they're basically distressed. And so they're not taking that time to interact with the world around them and learn and develop. That's basically what that means there. I remember hearing about a story of, um, you're probably familiar with this, that um, they did this with, with infant chimpanzees and they gave them the option to be with a kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a, a furry surrogate mother, not a real thing, you know, kind of like a something they put up like, you know, with, with you know, the feel soft and all that represented the mother. And then they, the option between that mm -hmm. and a mother that actually had like food, like, you know, like milk or something. And these infants actually preferred, you know, the, the, the cuddly the mother where they weren't getting the nutrition to the actual, to the other one, you know, just basically um, ex um, describing or um, just um, explaining how important this attachment is. Absolutely. Yep. And actually they did uh, a similar study with humans because previous to Bowlby, the going theory on attachment was that infants and children bond to whoever it is that feeds them. And so they tried having these kids uh, be f have them fed by somebody who's not their primary caregiver, i.e. their mother or their father usually. And um, they were still distressed 
versus being handled by their primary caregiver. So just food, just the basic needs, food, shelter, that's not enough. But if their basic needs aren't being met consistently, including uh, touch and validation, affirmation, et cetera, emotional and physical needs, then it's very negative on their development. So we see later in the 60s, developmental psychologist Mary Ainsworth, she discovered essentially attachment behavior, which is ways in which an insecure child tries to reestablish a connection with a caregiver. And that's the tantrums, the screaming, the crying, uh, sometimes, you know, hitting, getting close or clinging to a parent or caregiver things that we generally view as very negative, it's ways the child is trying to tell you something. And so what she did, she took 106 children with their primary caregiver and the primary caregiver would leave them with a staff member, which would be a turn. While the primary caregiver was away, she found that children with secure attachments were relatively calm and children with weak attachments were distressed until their caregiver returned. And if the attachments with their primary caregiver were especially bad, even if the primary caregiver returned, it didn't console them. And then finally in the 1980s, Hazan and Shaver looked at attachments between adults, which brings us basically to where we are now. Do so we have any questions we on that? Yeah, what you're saying, I think, is like fundamentally the I mean, you're, you're I think you're describing two differences between uh, kids that develop normally and kids that don't. And the first is the that the kids that don't just like you were saying before, they don't develop the the knowledge of how to communicate their needs. You know, they, they resort to tantrums or these like extreme emotional reactions because apparently, you know, their attachments to their parents weren't strong enough for them to be able to like, you know, learn those skills. And I think the other, the other um, major difference you're, you're saying is like that uh, aside from the communication, it's just the, the basic um, sense of trust that, 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 you know, so much confidence and trust in the parents yes. and whether they're there or not, you know, they, they, they have that maintain that. Absolutely. They actually mentioned that in the articles that I was reading, that they believe the children who are calmer were calmer because they felt more secure in the knowledge that their primary caregiver is going to return. They, they trusted that. Kind of like the puppy who tears things up in the house when you leave versus the puppy who wait, knows that you're going to come back and so stays calm. Does that make sense? That reminds me of something. Um, speak, uh, you know, speaking of a puppy. Well, see, there was this dog that we had to babysit for a while because its owner was going to Germany for a week, and when she left, that dog was so upset and would not quit staring out the window and barking and was scared that she was abandoning him. It was clear, clearly obvious that this dog was distressed, and it, it just made me think of that when. You mentioned that there is a difference between how different dogs act, how they're attached to their humans. And it's honestly the same thing with children. They're kind of, they're kind of, they're both about how they bond with their primary caregiver. You're correct. So again, tying this into the free will. So the, I've mentioned a lot. Of, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Tying this into the free will. It's saying that the studies indicate the study that, that they were making on the subject indicate that the children's behavior is affected by the relationship with their parents. The kids who had, did not have a strong, secure, consistent relationship with their primary caregiver reacted negatively if they felt like their primary caregiver was not or their needs were not being met. If they're pri or they were concerned that their primary caregiver wasn't going to return. I think if we just think about psychology in so general. So the way you're the way you're raised in relationships. Yeah, I think if we just think about psychology in general, we 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 can understand that the that whole field of psychology is something that that says that we lack free will. Basically, it's it's basically saying that the way our brain state is at the current 
in time is due to all of these environmental or genetic factors that lead up to the state that we are currently at. So, so the, the reason that, that, I mean, this attachment theory makes total sense is, is, is basic psychology. Psychology is the fact that when we're in an environment, our brain states change and, and that specific environment has the effect of changing our brains in a specific way. Well, you, you, Trick, you're entirely correct, but we have to also note that even though psychological theory so strongly refutes free will in so many ways, this just being part of it, you know, you, you won't read a psychology, an intro to psychology textbook that says, and this is why we don't have a free will. I mean, this field right. just runs away from that question, you know, ah. Oh. Yeah, that's true. They don't, well, they don't say it. They I, don't say I would it, yeah. say that they run away from it. I'd say that we're not really their concern. But Wait, it uh, is. they they, they, they not. do they they're don't not really, about they don't really give lip service to to, to free will uh, but they don't come out right and generally say it doesn't exist it's more like they're in their articles they're they're pretty much you know nudging you and winking and saying hey look there's no free will but they're not openly saying it because it's still kind of controversial yeah and and it's it's extremely I mean, relevant I wouldn't say that I wouldn't say that they're deliberately I, would, I think it's way too much to say that they're deliberately ignoring it or not saying it because of any reason. I don't think there's any evidence of that. I think it's more logical and more evidence-based to say that psychology deals with why we do the things we do, what effects that they have, how can well, we change that? Felicia, the question of whether or not there is free will very loosely deals with that. That's more of a philosophy question. I'd have to disagree because like, psychology is the study of the mind. And like this, this question of whether we have a free will or not goes to the very heart of who we are as individuals. Is what we do up to us or is it up to something that's completely apart from us? That's very integral to our psychological understanding of ourselves. I think the reason they avoid it, as, as I believe they, they intentionally do, is because, you know, at least here in the United States and, you know, throughout the, a lot of the world, you have churches, you have very religious people who, for example, contribute vast amounts to education to, to the, our colleges and universities and, and, you know, have political influence. I think this is a political issue for them. They don't want to rock the boat. George, you're not offering any, you're not offering any evidence for this conspiracy theory. <laughs> well, I think the evidence is that this, this knowledge that free will is impossible is so elementary. It's like a non-issue. It's non-controversial if you look at it logically. And for something to be so obvious... That's com this is completely subjective. Subjective? I mean, like, in, in what sense are you saying that? Because, like, I mean, I think we can, we can say with 100% certainty... I mean, certainty, this conspiracy theory is completely subjective. Yeah. Here's the problem, George, is, is the num there's, there's lots of psychologists or psychiatrists, psychologists, there's lots of these people out there, but I think a lot of them still believe that they have free will. So, so it's not, I don't think they've just, they, they, I don't think they've thought about the topic in that way, I guess. So they, I know, they, 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 they're kind of stuck in their own, I guess. Occam, Occam's little, razor. Yeah. So you're saying that instead of it being like something uh, related to their character and a moral issue, you're saying that they're just not very bright. They're just like, you know, <laughs> you have to be profoundly unintelligent not to get this. I think or, they have they're the just, attachment They're just not issues. thinking about the topic. They're just... No. I think that really they just haven't thought about it. Like they really, it hasn't, the free will topic, because it's perceived as some philosophical thing, they don't see the importance and relevance it has and its conflict with basic psychology. But once it's pointed out to them, then maybe it's... Guys, this is, this is all speculation. Yeah. This yeah. is all speculation. And also... Well, it has to be. That, that's, that's, I mean, what else? I mean, like... They don't, uh, for example, if we look at the evidence, like, for example, nature and nurture, that's standard psychology theory. The role of the unconscious in decision-making is standard psychology theory. So we could point to two, three, four parts of psychology that strongly refute free will. So then, like, we're left wondering, wait a minute, if all the evidence is there, and this is objective evidence, it's not, it's not subjective, then why aren't they direct, directly addressing it? And so, yes, yeah, certainly, like, we're speculating. Okay, but what, George. What else can, I, can we do? Um, well, first of all, we can talk about it in the next episode because this is off topic. Second of all, you yeah. can bring me actual evidence of a conspiracy that they're deliberately not saying anything. Okay, go ahead. 
So if you want something more than speculation, then you'd have to actually go to psychologists and ask and pull them and do a study on psychologists and what's going on with free will. But speculation like this, I don't think is going to get us anywhere. And accusing them of deliberately misleading the public is not going to get us anywhere either. Yeah, but we. And yeah. I would like and to. My, and my point, my point, bringing we, up psychology just is was just to basically say that that if we look at psychology, we can understand that that what it, that free will and psychology don't really mesh well together. So we, so that's the only reason I brought it up. So but I didn't mean to get into thing, a different debate on, on in terms of speculating. We, we either speculate that they're profoundly, they're just you know lacking moral character, or that they're profoundly unintelligent. And this isn't subjective. It's got to be body, It's got to be one or the other. No, you know, no, so like, no. There's a third option, which is that they just have thought about. They just haven't fallacy. thought about the philosophy of it. I disagree so. because this is so obvious. Anybody who's that a is a false dichotomy. Style. I disagree. I'm sorry. You are more than welcome to disagree. So attachment styles, uh, attachment behavior is simply the contact. They look at the contact attempts of the child with the parent, pro like proximity seeking, um, how long they're in contact with the primary caregiver, maintenance, resistance, and avoidance. And we end up with basically four different attachment styles. The first of which is a par is approximately 65% of the population, and that is the secure attachment style. The child's needs are met, caregivers respond to um, attachment behavior quickly, sensitively, and consistently. So the child is happy, secure, and explorative. So that, that's the optimum right there. The second is avoidant attachment. And this affects approximately 20% of the population gauged. The child is consequently emotionally distant and not very explorative. The third is anxious slash ambivalent. Uh, those words are used interchangeably. And this is 10 to 15% where the, caregiv the caregiver is inconsistent, sometimes sensitive, sometimes neglectful. So the child is anxious, insecure, and angry. And lastly is disorganized. And this is also 10 to 15% of the population. The caregiver is extremely erratic, passive or intrusive, frightened or frightening. The child is consequently depressed, angry, non-responsive, and completely passive. So what I wanted to do next was go around the group and see which attachment style do you think you had with your parents as a kid? Is it possible to mix and match, or do we have to just pick one? <laughs> I think, honestly, I think it's more of a sliding scale um, with those being the four points. I don't think that anyone has a 100% secure attachment or a 100%, um, well, I guess that's the only one I don't think it could possibly be 100%. But, um, yeah, if you, wanted, if you wanted to give mostly this, but some of this, I, I think that would be fine. I think I fall closer to the last one, the disordered one. Okay. I'm not sure which one I fall on, but let me give you a, a small anecdote. Uh, when I was nine years old, I wanted to, uh, I didn't, I, I refused to go to school unless my parents bought me a super soaker water gun. And I actually played hooky for about a week. And uh, eventually, my aunt, who lived a couple blocks away, drove me to the store and bought me a super soaker water gun. And I eventually went to school. So what do you think that would indicate? You really like super soakers. How old were you? I was nine. Nine? Super soakers. What about, um, what about... How did your parents react to report cards, good grades, or something good you did in sports? Were they around? No, I never ever played sports. I, no, I hated no, no, sports. No, no. What about um, grades then? Things that you were interested in? Uh, my parents were kind of uh, indifferent. You know, they would say, yay, great, but never anything spectacular. Okay. Let's see. Never anything spectacular. So I would go with avoidant. Caregiver is distant and disengaged. The child you know is emotionally kind of distant like, and not very exploitative. Do you know what kind of long-term psychological effects that has? Yes, and we'll do that right after we get everybody's. <laughs> uh, right. Trick, what about you? I'm sorry, what was the okay. last one David, again? David, George, Jamie? I've got the last idea. one is dis 
disorganized. Yeah, where the caregiver is extremely erratic, passive or intrusive, frightened or frightening, and thus the child is depressed, angry, non-responsive, and completely passive. Okay, I'm not that, or if that wasn't me. Yeah, see, these are tough because it seems like, like when, I, when, I, when I read them, like I have the, the, the sheet that you sent that has the three, but it wasn't it was missing disorganized. But when I read these, I, I kind of think that I'm three of them here. So so it's so it's kind of bizarre. So I'm not sure how to how to make the assessments. Go to go to somebody else. I'll, I'll, okay, with so oh, you, the other three. You can use me. I was going to go with. Um, think about kind it. Of, okay. Kind of avoid avoidment and disorganized. Kind of somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. So maybe anxious. So it's very um, inconsistent. Sometimes uh, they're very sensitive. Sometimes they're really not sensitive. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. That one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm going with amb Jamie ambivalent for mine. Uh, Trick, did you want to finish? Just spoke? I, I said I'm going, I'm going with ambivalent for mine. <laughs> I think uh, I right, was... With, with... With me, my, you know, I think my parents were very good parents in a lot of ways. I, I, you know, I felt confident. I, you know, I achieved certain things, which is interesting because, like, as an adult, I really haven't uh, succeeded in, in, like, for example, a long staying. I've never been married, for example. And so I think in my case, I, I recently kind of, like, realized a couple of months ago, I'm, the, I'm a lot more intelligent than the vast majority of people. And that creates a difference. That, that creates huge problems you know, that, that can't really be dealt with, you know, in terms of, like, attachment styles and all. Cause, but, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I felt very loved and very supported by my parents. So, so mostly secure then? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Jamie? Um, I'm not sure what to say to say the truth. <laughs> okay, well, think about things that you cared about when you were a kid. Think about things you did well or were excited about. And how did your parents react? I get a bit nervous when I'm asked these sort of questions. So what about you, Chandler? Sorry, I tried to warn you ahead of time. Yeah, well, um, see, like, I, I think, even though it's hard for me to remember all the different terms exactly, I'm thinking I'm somewhere disorganized or anxious or avoidant or some way because I know that secure is definitely not the word that, it, that would express my relationship with my parents exactly, you know? Um, cause I, I would say the first, like, you know, first five years of my life were, were pretty messed up and, and not to get too into details, but when you consider sexual abuse and a very bad divorce involving an abusive father, I became very, maybe very avoidant and not trusting of anyone or anything. And I think that explains about what's wrong with me today. <laughs> But Chandler, it's interesting that so, you're a very uh, personable, likable person that likes uh, other people. Yeah, and that's what's ironic. Um, I think that, I, I think it's more like, it's more about fear. It's more about, um, I care about people, but I'm very afraid of them and afraid of being hurt. That makes, that actually makes perfect sense with this theory. And that, you know, it doesn't that sound makes like you're alone. Sense. Cause, cause and people, I just want to say though that, uh, I was going to say that this should not this should not be taken to say that there is anything wrong with anybody or that or broken or anything like that. This is simply looking at a cause and effect. What brought us here? That's that's all. What would you and say? I know you fall under... I know that that can be very difficult still. What I mean, what's what uh, me? Felicia, because yeah. for example, we, we have a first uh, marriage divorce rate of about 50% here in the United States, and it's similar throughout the world. Now, what, um, how would you describe it? Because, like, when, when, you know, is there a reason why you're um, suggesting we sh shouldn't describe this dynamic as wrong or, or as broken? I, I wouldn't describe it as wrong, certainly, because that's blaming. But I think, you know, I think, you know, we have a dysfunctional society in a lot of ways. Again, this first marriage divorce rate of 50 percent being just one example uh we have a lot of alienation a lot of isolation um how would you describe it um it, that that kind of like you know has us understand what we're facing if not like you know with with um adjectives adjectives like broken broken i'm not saying that either that any of these um 
attachment styles. I'm not saying that all of these are beneficial or ideal. I'm saying that none of us, regardless of the issues that we might encounter because of the attachment style is broken. So no individual, none of us, like at Chandler, I detected some distress in your voice as you were, as your childhood and kind of some of the things that you've had to um, overcome maybe as a result of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm reacting to that, George. I'm saying, Chandler, there's nothing wrong with you. I think that you are a good person and you've had a lot more to overcome than say someone in, in George's position or in my position who had a mostly secure uh, attachment style, but there's nothing wrong with you. And I want, I really want you to know that, understand that this is a, well, that's a good point. Yes. Yes. Thanks Felicia. And I want everyone to know, you know, yeah. like, I, I know that no one's to blame for how they end up. And that's the important thing about understand we don't have a free will is, Nobody, even if they were considered um, broken or wrong by someone's definition, it's not their fault, and that's an important thing. I just know that, um, like, sure, I wish that I would be a little bit more towards secure. I wish that things in my past had been different. Um, so I wouldn't say that I'm broken beyond repair or wrong in, like, I've done something wrong. It's more just like, well... I just realized that this is not ideal where I'm at. I think we also, I think we also, I think we also have to recognize that it's not. I mean, it's also the home life itself that couldn't have been otherwise. So, so when when we when we're talking about how, you know, our, we we're treated by our parents or how we interacted with our parents, we have to understand that they themselves also has have these psychologies that were brought about through. These long, these the identical same long mechanisms of, of psychology. So, so we have to recognize that the very environment that we're in when we're a child is a product of of, of these past events as well. So, so that's part of the free will topic. I think that we need to Absolutely. get into here. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. So, like, basically, that's one Absolutely. of the huge problems the free will belief creates. You know, like if we don't blame ourselves, we'll blame our parents, which is just as wrong. Yeah, if we can't blame ourselves, then how can we blame other people? Yeah. And I talked to that. I don't hear you right now. Felicia. I'm sorry, what did you say, you keep Jamie? You're cutting out, Felicia. I was saying, um, if we can't blame ourselves, then how can we blame other people? I, I agree with George. Well, you know, uh, Sarah Palin recently yeah. blamed. We have to remember uh, that our parents our also have. Son's uh, PTSD. Say that and again, Michael. Beating up his uh, girlfriend or wife. Michael, say that again. Uh, did you hear Sarah Palin recently blamed Barack Obama for her son beating up his uh, his wife? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear this. It was on the day that she endorsed Donald Trump. On the day oh. she endorsed Donald Trump, her son got arrested for assaulting his wife. And, of course, she blames Obama. <laughs> <laughs> well, in politics, everybody blames everybody else for everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, once everyone gets this no free will message, there'll be the same thing with life. <laughs> there'll be yeah, without blame, politics doesn't run in the way it does. <laughs> you can just blame Obama for everything, pretty much. The world doesn't run the way it does. And without free will, there would be no no um, right wing left wing paradigm. Everyone would just be working toward a better future. So yeah. I hope so. I mean, uh, uh, it, it, so some to, people could be to recap, be Go ahead, Felicia. Uh, to recap, to recap, before we take a look at what this means for our development, these attachment styles, uh, we had um, Chandler said that he felt disorganized attachment style best fits his childhood. Uh, David and Trick said anxious or ambivalent. Michael well, said avoidant. And George and I had most... Sorry? And then George and I had mostly secure attachment styles as kids. So let's take a look at what that means. Okay. All right. Who wants to... Uh, he wants to go first. 
Who wants to hear this first? Uh, David, you got anything? <laughs> oh, cheers, mate. Yeah, yeah. Do me first. <laughs> okay. So, All right. So, uh, David, you said you had an anxious or ambivalent relationship with your parents where the caregiver is inconsistent, sometimes sensitive and sometimes neglectful. Uh, for a child, that would mean that they may be wary of strangers. They may become greatly de uh, distressed when the parent leaves. And they do not appear comforted by the return of the parent. As an adult, this child may be reluctant to become close to others, worry that their partner does not love them, or, and, and or become very distraught when a relationship ends. That's actually very accurate, yeah. I'm actually surprised. <laughs> um, and then I want to I wanna avoid um, sort of the, what is it, the astrological signs type thing where basically everything fits everybody, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. does anybody else feel like this? Who else feels like that fits them? Um. um. I, I can't Trick? Can't, I can't really say anything because I don't have experience. Um, yeah, it's, it, so. I, I was kind of ambivalent between, <laughs> between the ambivalent and secure. So I, I don't know. So yeah, it's, it seems like part of, the, part of these fit, fit me. Like I'm reluctant to come close to others because I'm shy and, and introverted in, in many ways. Um, but I also have trusting, lasting relationships in the secure end. So I don't, I don't know. So. I don't know. I, I feel that I'm, I'm in between some of these, so it's, it's hard to tell for me. Okay, okay. All right, and then, uh, David, did you want to say kind of how you feel about that relationship style and what that's meant for your development? Um, I, I had a question. I mean, what, what, kind of, um, what kind of behaviors would that lead me to do? Like, um, what kind of coping strategies would I be uh, more likely to do if, if that was the case? Would you be more likely to do or would be recommended? Uh, what would I be more likely to do, I guess, is the, uh, is the question. Um, statistically, I'm not sure what would be most likely, what actions this person might likely take as a response to this as far as coping however um i have found that working with a psychologist and or a psychiatrist has helped me in a lot of ways and i think that everyone on the face of the planet could benefit for that um i would also recommend books by brene brown so you, you're recommending i go to therapy what did you say david i recommend that everybody goes to therapy <laughs> yeah, it's a part of. It like, part I mean, of the I mean, literally every single person can <laughs> ben benefit from therapy. I agree. <laughs> and I'm yeah. also speaking as someone who's been to a lot of therapy. So I, I've been to a lot of therapy as a kid, and then again as an adult. So I'm, I'm speaking from experience, not judgment. Uh, also, books by Brene Brown have helped. So what you're saying is people should like once in a while go to see a shrink to make sure that. Everything's fine. No, yeah, not just to make sure everything is all right, but like, like, like you know, we're, we're all flawed in certain ways and all. So, like, to, to mm -hmm. just improve ourselves, to correct what, what needs to be corrected. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if someone has anger management issues, then they need to uh, find ways to deal with the stress because stress hormones um, are related to cardiovascular problems, aren't they? So. Oh, I just wanted to tack on to what Jamie said about anger management and that he's, and Jamie, you're entirely correct. Anger management, depression, a lot of these more major issues uh, should be dealt with in therapy. But even, even minor things like, um, for instance, I felt like I was responsible for other people's happiness. And that put a lot of stress and anxiety on me. And that was something I was able to deal with in therapy. So it's even, it's even small things. It doesn't have to be a major issue. Even things, any insecurities or, you know, doubts, issues with self-worth, anything like that is, is excellent. I think she's 
Yeah, I think you cut out for a while, Felicia. It's sad when there's audio problems. Mm. That's sad. Um, I was saying, I was saying that it's not just the major issues like depression or anger management issues, but also smaller things. For instance, uh, I used to feel like other people's happiness was my responsibility. Mm-hmm. And that was something I was able to work through through therapy. Or when I, when someone thought I did something wrong and I didn't, I was extremely upset that they wouldn't believe me. And that I was essentially punished for this thing that I didn't do. And I said, you know, they didn't even give me a chance to hear my side of the story. And my therapist like, well, why does it matter? Why does it matter if... They they don't listen to you. Is that like your problem? You keep bottling up inside. And he helped me come to the realization that other people's opinion of me. What? I was saying that well, insecurity is things that we keep bottled up inside. I mean, they can get worse and worse if we don't talk to someone about it. Yeah. And they can also help fix some of that self talk that you do. So hmm. I mean. Therapy is beneficial whether it's a, a tiny issue or a large issue. That's all I'm saying. And it, it should probably um, be incorporated into the school system. See. In other words, like, you know, we all have to learn how to read, right? So instead of reading whatever they, they make us read, K through 12, I mean, we could be reading about this stuff, you know, developing a, uh, healthy attachment skills, making sure that we're not other directed that like our opinion of ourselves is more about what we think of ourselves than what others think and all i mean we, we, this, this can be taught and it ties into the free will issue uh, like you said george i mean if people blame themselves in this or didn't blame didn't blame themselves at all then they'll be less likely to become depressed wouldn't they and the other part jamie is that like with the free will belief you know it's like well that person is that the way they are because of their free will. They're choosing to be that way, and so yeah. that that perspective just um, just basically prevents us from looking into the causes. And if we don't look into the causes, we don't find the solution. So yeah, exactly. And that's what a shrink's job is to look at the causes and then try to um, find a way to treat the person who's suffering from whatever insecurities that you know they're in. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Felicia's point earlier that everyone um, would benefit from therapy is absolutely true because everyone has issues in their life, things they're not satisfied, certain problems, and if they get to the root of those things, then they can work on finding the causes of those problems so they can eliminate them. But telling everyone about the free will illusion would be an important step as well. Everyone needs to know about this. Um, Michael, would you like to hear about yours next? Michael? Hey, Michael, you there? Michael, come on. Is Michael with us? Oh, hey. Was I prompted for something? Sorry. <laughs> Hello? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if you wanted, if you wanted to do yours next. Oh, damn. Uh... I, uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't think I can do it right now. I, I, I just don't know how to assess it. Um, so maybe we'll have to, to pass. Okay. Um, yeah. George, do you, so do you, you and I want to go next? Yeah, my reaction, um, so most specifically you wanted me to kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, explain mine, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so George and I both uh, said that our relationship with our parents is mostly secure, which means that we were able to separate from our parents, seek comfort from parents when frightened, uh, return of parents is met with positive emotions, and we prefer parents to strangers. As an adult, what that looks like is uh, ability to have trusting and lasting relationships, tend to have good self-esteem, comfortable in sharing feelings with friends and partners and able to seek out social support. Yeah. So like here in my case, I mean, I, would I you say that's true? 
I, I agree with that. I, in my case, I had a very successful childhood, you know, did really well um, with friends, whatever. Then, but moving into adulthood, again, that like, I, I think the attachment styles explains a lot of this, but there, there are certainly other dynamics at play. Because, like, for example, I used to go to summer camp, and I could be Absolutely. away at some, you know, I'd, 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 I'd like my parents, I wouldn't miss them, you know, it was great. But, but you know, like, so as an adult, you know, I haven't been the most successful with, with lasting relationships. And so, yeah, there, there's got to be some other explanations also, yeah. I yeah, this, this is not... Something like the thing being cut out, like the, the audio being cut out from time to time. Should we all, should we start a new call? Uh, no, I just wanted to know if it's just me or if everyone else is seeing the the audio drop. No, it's definitely dropping. Like like, I, Felicia's cutting out a lot. She's but then she comes back in. So I don't know. Yeah, I'll have to edit out some awkward silence when I do the editing for this. Yeah. All right. So it's not just me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, fully. Uh. So no. I, what, what, when you, when you asked me okay. last time, I thought I was supposed to say something. I didn't know that it was uh, you were supposed to assess me from what I said before. Okay, so do you, are you? Do you want to go ahead and do sure. that now? You can, okay. Yeah. You can go ahead. Um, Michael, you said that you had mostly. Michael, you said mostly that you had an avoidant relationship with your parents. Uh, which means that uh, the child may avoid the parents some, does not seek much comfort or contact from the parents, and shows little or no preference between parents and strangers. As an adult, this child may have problems with intimacy, invest little emotion in social and romantic relationships, and be unwilling or unable to share thoughts and feelings with others. Uh, that's definitely true of my dad. Uh, me and my dad had a very distant relationship. My parents did divorce when I was young and, um, me and my mm -hmm. dad, we never got along. Uh, so that's, that's definitely, and I definitely <laughs> avoid my dad. I don't really, uh, seek out any kind of contact with him. Uh, I really only do kind of like the necessary things like holidays and maybe birthdays. Uh, with my mom, it's a little bit more. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm in contact with her a little bit more. I'm a little bit more closer with her. Uh, but again, also, uh, I generally don't like to spend a lot of time around my, my parents that much. So in that respect, I would say it's definitely pretty much right on, right on the spot. What about as an adult? Um, yeah, kind of. I mean, I, I, I kind of, I treat Does adult... As an adult, I, I treat people like my parents in the se in the sense that uh, uh, I am cautious about. Um, I always think that like people are fickle, and I generally don't like kind of uh, put a lot of weight in trust in people. I don't I don't trust generally that 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 much, and uh, I I tend to just think like I need to get things done on my own. I, I don't like to rely on other people because they always tend to let me down. And I've had a lot of friends over the years that have disappeared. You know, like we're great friends for a year and then like we we're not friends anymore. And over the years that has kind of made me not think of like people as like stay you know like when, when you when you meet someone you think like okay this person is going to be in my life a long time regardless of whether you know it's a friend or a romantic situation i tend to think like maybe that maybe that's not going to be the case you know and so just um just just look at it as like that's a possibility and uh just not being hurt or or not being surprised if that's what turns out to be the case. Is that about do a it? A pretty good fit then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that about does it. Um, and then Chandler. Yeah. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. Um, now you you brought up some things that you said that you struggle with. And um basically going to read read that back out from psychalive.org okay 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 
you said that you mostly had a, a disorganized relationship with your, I think, primarily your mother. Well, it's it's kind of strange. Primary caregiver. It, yeah, I, I, you know, I've lived with my mother and I've had no contact with my father for at least 12 years. It's it's kind of a strange thing, but I, I it's a general, I feel more like everything is fear-based. Like, I, can, I can see that. Yeah, like maybe I can clarify a little bit. Like being afraid to talk say for example anything about religion or politics or about controversial things for fear of being yelled at let's just put it that way ouch yeah that that's the type of um fear you know? okay um yeah so disorganized attachment is when the caregiver is extremely erratic, passive or intrusive, frightened or frightening, and the child tends to be depressed, angry, non-responsive, and or completely passive. As an adult, someone who had a disorganized attachment um, often won't learn healthy ways to self-soothe. They may have trouble socially or struggle in using others to co-regulate their emotions. It may be difficult for them to open up to others or seek out help. They often have difficulty trusting people as they were unable to trust those they relied on for safety growing up. They may struggle in their relationships or friendships or in parenting their own children. Their social lives may further be affected as people with secure attachments tend to go on better through their development. Children with secure attachments are often treated better by peers or even teachers in school. On the other hand, those with disorganized attachments, because they struggle with uh, poor social or emotional regulation skills, may find it difficult to form and sustain solid relationships. They often have difficulty managing stress and may even demonstrate hostile or aggressive behavior. Because of their negativity, early life, negative early life experiences, they may see the world as an unsafe place. Yeah, sounds about accurate. Um, of course, the, none of none of the things we read is permanent. There are, of course, ways to heal from negativity in the past and um, that do, should do also you know be how, remembered do you know how some of these uh were tested for like like did they actually test children and then and then like years later test the adults or did they have a questionnaire for, for adults I, I can look into that a little bit more um i would think children as they grew up but they could have done a questionnaire for the adults as well. I can look into that a little bit more. Because I know there's like so many there's different tests, like the Myers Briggs and all, all these different psychological tests. So, so I'm just wondering how, how this, this one, especially with the, with the gap between childhood and, and adult age, uh, is, is looked into. Like, is it our assessment of our childhood or is it our actual childhood, which I think could be two, two different things. So, so I don't know. But I just, I just I think it's important, like, the process that people take when they make uh, studies and stuff. So. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. From what I gather, though, this is something that has been extensively researched, considering okay. the sources that I've gotten it from. And this is the sort of thing that they're teaching in the college childhood development classes ah. that the forensic linguist is in so i feel pretty secure in this information um okay. i can however find some more information about the method if you'd like uh this is no big deal i was just i was just wondering if you knew off the top of your head so you don't have to look into it further if you don't want <laughs> okay um no I, I do not know off the top of my head so um i guess we can we can finish that up with discussing either uh, how we feel about our 
own analysis of our childhood and what that's meant for our development. We can discuss how that works with free will. It's up to you guys. I think um, that we could fit this more in to the idea of Valentine's Day, since Valentine's Day, like about how people's relationships, their long-term relationships with their with their significant others or whatever you call it, you know, just how, like, can somebody um, see those connections between how they relate to other people and adults in that way or perhaps with coworkers also? Because um, I think that those are the three main types of relationships in our lives is our caregivers growing up, but then there's people we work with at our jobs, and then there's people who get into romantic relationships. And it seems that some things would apply to all those relationships. I'm just trying to piece it all together. Uh, I also have an, an article that we don't really have time to go over now, but it, we could post that in the description of wherever we're posting things nowadays that discusses attachments uh, among adults, which would be um, the type of theory that was developed in the 80s that we went over briefly. There are healthy and less healthy attachment styles between adults as well. Yeah, because actually that's an interesting question. Because in other words, like I thought that the, the findings you were um, presenting were on children. And so one of my questions was, how much does that carry over into adulthood? Do, is the way we are as kids pretty much the way we become our adult, adults? Or do we tend to kind of like learn and correct some of these things, you know, as, as we experience more life? I'm sure some of these can be learned and correct or even undone. For instance, I mostly had a secure childhood. But as I became a young adult, my secure attachment style with my parents um, degraded significantly, swiftly, and catastrophe. Uh, it was more of a catastrophe by the end of it. So much so that we're not even speaking anymore. It's coming up on two years now since I've spoken with them. Um, it, it, our attachment style changed greatly. And I also had subsequent issues because of that. Like I, I developed anxiety, ab abandonment issues and tr some trust issues because of that. So it can change throughout our life, but the most significant part, uh, this most significant time for attachments and what that means for your personality is within the first couple of years of childhood. And that absolutely does, uh, transfer into our adult life as we looked at, um, a, a little bit ago. Yeah, well, tying this back into the free will thing, like, for example, I was estranged from my brothers for the last three, four years, you know, to a great extent, because I published this book, this brilliant book, Refuting Free Will, and they, I didn't get a response from them. I mean, like, you know, being the youngest, they always ignore me. So anyway, but my point is that, like, as a result of, of not attributing, not blaming them, of understanding they don't have a free will, it really wasn't them, then like actually just very recently, the last several months or so, I've reestablished my connection with them. So, so, so to whatever extent this, this you know, um, less than perfect uh, attachment styles and the way we develop, you know, to whatever extent it creates problems, you know, understanding that other people aren't to blame, we aren't to blame, that we don't have a free will, that, in, in my personal experience, it, it helps me so much, and it really has been a major part of, of reconnecting with, with my brothers. Felicia, how does that sound with your parents and all? Like, do you, do you kind of like, because I, I know from my experience, we can understand that we don't have a free will, but it's so much harder to live our lives that way. I, I, how, how does like, that relate to your experience with your parents? Uh, I mean, I understand that the way they act is a re uh, they acted is a, was a result of how they were raised and their environment, their psychology, their brain chemistry, etc. I also recognize that it was an unhealthy relationship and it was um, affecting me negatively. And I don't, I don't owe anybody a toxic relationship. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. So. 
even though I don't, I don't necessarily blame them. I don't blame them for what happened. I do, however, recognize that it was a really terrible situation and it was not acceptable behavior. They did not treat me in a way that I deemed to be acceptable or respectful. And I also recognize that I don't have to put up with that. Exactly. And we, we point that out. In other words, like, you know, if somebody's coming after us, fine. They don't have a free will, but we have, we have a right to defend ourselves. Exactly. So even though it's not their fault, doesn't mean that I want them in, in my life. Because whatever the reasons, and we've looked at some of them today, they're not, they were not able to interact with me in a positive manner. And it was negatively affecting me. So how, so really, so like we have these problems. So let, maybe, do you want to focus on like how understanding that we don't have a free will can contribute to our own, like, you know, we can't change people sometimes. We could certainly change ourselves. How, how perhaps our attachment styles can improve as we, you know, uh, cease to blame ourselves or others for, for how we are. Um, I mean, I know, I know for me, there's some level of peace and knowing that while it wasn't an ideal situation, that they did love me to the best of their own ability. It's just that that wasn't good enough, you know, for, and uh, for us to continue in our relationship the way it was, considering they were not willing to change. Right. So in your um, situation, that does not, however, Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. now in your situation, so fine. It, you know, understanding we don't have free will <clears throat> doesn't solve everything, but at the very least, it doesn't add to it. I mean, look, it's unfortunate, like, your relationship isn't as good as, with your parents as you'd like it to be, but I think it's a blessing that you don't blame them because that would be like, you know, that would be, you know, just adding to, 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 the, um, to the, the situation. And so, like, yeah, the understanding we don't have a free will makes things easier to accept. I, I think it did help me work through some of the anger and pain. It doesn't it doesn't erase the the pain, the hurt that I felt and the hurt that they caused me. It doesn't erase that knowing not hurt. It does however help me move on from that after I've worked through the hurt. You know, I just thought of something else. If people believe in free will, one problem is they'll keep trying to fix things that are not fixable. They'll just keep thinking, well, if I just make the right choices, then I'll be able to fix my relationship with this person. Or if they just make the right choices, then they then they would fix it with me. And then I think what happens is we waste the rest of our lives trying to fix things that aren't fixable sometimes because we keep thinking that that, um, you know, things can just be better easily when that's not always the case. So we might save, our, save ourselves trouble if we do just realize that we have to move on. That's a good point, Chandler. Absolutely. I completely, I completely agree. You know, uh, I've had a, a lot of people, um, I've had some people actually react very harshly to me when they heard that I wasn't in contact with my parents, that I essentially disowned them, that were estranged. Um, someone went on a rant to my, my best friend about how I was a fool for not having my parents in my life. But and, uh, and some other people, um, like my, my in-laws, they don't, they don't want to talk about my relationship with my parents. They don't want to talk about my parents. And they there's like, you know, someday they're going to they're going to realize that it's more important to have you in their lives than it is for them to um, to hold on to those opinions the way that they are. And the thing is, though, that doesn't do me any good. The what ifs, the maybe whens, that doesn't help me. I've accepted that it is what it is and it may change later down the line. But right now. It is exactly as it is. And yeah. I'm not going to waste time or energy um, on the what ifs, the maybes, the fixing it. I recognize it's not about me, about earning it, about worthiness. 
I'm worthy just because I am, I'm human. I'm a decent person. It, what it is though, is just that who they are isn't, con isn't conducive to my life. And that's just, that's just the baseline of that. That's what it boils down to. Yeah, I think it's important for us to recognize that our future happiness for our whole lifetime, it can't depend on our relationship with our parents because think about people who their parents died when they were very young, but they still have a life to live in spite of that, and they can still find happiness, and they don't have a relationship with their parents. So you're kind of stuck in the same boat whether you've had a falling out with your parents or whether they died. It's similar. There are also uh, situations where people oh, yeah, are too attached to their parents, and it can be very bad as well. Like, there's this guy who lives around me, and uh, I knew him as a kid growing up. And he's always been socially awkward and weird and a loner. And every single time I see him in public, he's with his mother. And, like, I think that she's, like, the only friend or person in his life at all. I've never seen him with any friends. I've never seen him with a girlfriend. He's just like Norman Bates. He's like with his mother all the time. And that itself, in and of itself, can have a tremendous psychological uh, impact on people because they may be so attached to their family that the idea of going out of the family circle is like venturing into danger. And like it makes them unable to uh, create relationships in the outside world. And yeah, that that's gonna that's awful. gonna mostly be the ambivalent or anxious attachment style. So yeah, I mean the reason we do this work on free will is to create a happier world. And so I think I think one of the things we're saying now is like um, that things don't have to be the way we prefer that they were. The world doesn't have to be the way we prefer that it would be for us to be as happy as we need to be as we want to be. That's where, you know, Buddhists are very into this. They, they understand this. And, you know, that, that's a very important message about all this. In other words, like, to the extent we understand we don't have a free will, we're not judging ourselves. We're not judging others. We're not even judging the world in a certain sense. And that just, like, helps things a lot. You know, we can just focus on our happiness without these distracting, you know, judgments and, and reactions. Yeah, I think it comes to realizing that the world will never be as ideal as we might want it to be. We might want a, a paradise or a heaven or something like that where nobody ever experiences any pain. And yet at some point we try to be happy even though we realize we may not live to see that day. So should we start wrapping it up? Yeah. What do you guys think? Sounds good. Okay. You've been listening to Free Will, Science, and Religion, and we've been talking about attachment styles and relationships and happiness and how it relates to the free will topic. We don't have to blame ourselves for the, for the failures of our past relationships with our parents or other relationships even in our adulthood. We know it wasn't up to us. But that doesn't mean that we can't change and improve as we learn better how. And everyone benefits from therapy. <laughs> so, um, hope you learned something. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Everyone can learn to understand themselves better and, and improve their relationships and happiness and maybe become a little bit more secure. That, that's our hope anyway. <laughs> Thank you for listening and goodbye.